All right, so on this beautiful Friday afternoon, let's start with cricket on the sports back zone. It was a day of mixed emotions for James Anderson as he said goodbye to the glorious game after 20 years. The result was favourable for the home team, beating West Indies by an innings and 114 runs early on day three. The Windies, starting the day on 79 for six, lost their final four wickets in the in under 15 overs to be dismissed for 136. Now, Gurukesh Moti put up a valiant effort to top score with 31, but it could not save off the brilliance from debutant Goss Atkinson, who took 5 for 61 to end with 12 wickets in the match. Well, the scores in the match, West Indies 121 and 136, England 371. The home team, they lead the three-match series 1-0. James Anderson walked away from Lords, the ground where he made his debut against Zimbabwe in 2003 with 704 wickets. The right-arm seamer reflected on his career. I'm trying to, still trying to hold him back now, but it's, it's, um, I think I'm just really proud of what you know, playing for 20-odd years is, uh, is an incredible effort, especially for a fast bowler, so I'm just happy that I've made it this far, happy that I've been lucky enough to stay injury free pretty much throughout my career and yeah, playing for England's like, it's the best job in the world so I've, I've been privileged to be able to do it for a long time. All right, let's now get the thoughts of Fazir Mohammed, who is at Lords doing commentary. Good afternoon, Faz. Good afternoon to you, Maria. Yeah, so, you know, we just heard from James Anderson um, finally putting into context for me that he won't be suiting up for Test cricket again, for cricket. No, he won't, but he'll stay part of the England setup because he immediately becomes uh, the, the bowling mentor or bowling coach uh, for England. So uh, he may not be in action on the field anymore, but he'll be in action off the field from the start of the second Test match at Trent Bridge in Nottingham on Thursday, but it obviously will be a very different role. And uh, clearly there was a lot of emotion, even a few tears uh, towards the end here with uh, the, the tremendous reception uh, that he was given. And I think it's a measure of how much he's appreciated by the English audience, especially because everybody knew that barring something really remarkable, that there was only going to be at best an hour's play, yet the ground was almost full. There were almost 30,000 people at Lord's today. And no doubt it was primarily to say farewell well to the test career of Jimmy Anderson. Yeah, and you know, you made that point and of course gave us that piece of information that he automatically goes into the England setup as a bowling consultant, bowling coach, however we may term it. And I started to think like, why doesn't something like that happen? And it also fast draws into the system that um, is common in many other countries because that happens in plenty other places where you know a top class player departs from their playing career and they go back to serve in a different capacity thereby you know lending their talent and experience to younger players that will be so happy to get it but you know that sometimes is very uncommon in West Indies cricket and we hear it from time to time where like I've sat in interviews where players say that you know they don't feel to go back because they don't feel that sort of respect they don't feel like they're wanted and there's always that sort of uneasiness so when you made that point just now and I know we're celebrating the career of James Anderson I couldn't help but you know mention that to you yeah it's, it's a fair point uh, and the, the, the difference is that uh, as much as we may not want to accept it we, we in the Caribbean are very immature uh, when it comes to situations like this because uh, we, we still are, are chained by a colonial mentality that's that says that whoever is in charge will have to dictate everything and anybody who feels at the lower levels that they're getting too big for your bridges, you need to be cut down to size. And I'm not saying that everybody who has served West Indies cricket well automatically should walk into a coaching role, a mentorship role, an administrative role or anything like that. But you get the sense that, that there's almost a fear of prominent former players getting involved because they may overshadow 
those who are in the positions already. But as I said, it's a deeper issue than, than we have time to, to, to reflect on, but, but really it reflects a, a really shallow mentality that, that really has us where we are. Yeah, well, I agree, Faz. So we're going to now focus on the match. And of course, West Indies have been beaten in two days, so much so that, you know, there has been a press release that the fans will be refunded for the match and all of that. Uh, Craig Brathwaite, though, he did a press conference earlier today. And he, well, he was forced, based on the question, to, of course, find the positives to, um, you know, let the players and, of course, the fans not feel too upset. And one of the things he said, you know, is don't give up that test cricket is very, very difficult. And he spoke to the positivity scene when it came to the West and he's bowling down England. Your comments on what he had to say. Well, well he, he really has no choice but to look for the positives. He can't very well say, you know, we've been beaten so badly, we might as well pack up and go home because there are two test matches still to play. And we've seen from fairly recent evidence that the West Indies are capable of rebounding. After losing in Adelaide in two days and a session much like this test match, the West Indies famously won in Brisbane to level the series. In 2017, the West Indies, after losing in three days in Birmingham, losing 19 wickets on that third day, rebounded to win at Headingley, uh, chasing 322 on the last day. So there is fairly recent precedent that the West Indies are, are, are capable of, of rebounding from the, this humiliating defeat. But it doesn't diminish the, the deflating sort of feeling you get when you see a West Indies side beaten and beaten as badly as what have happened here. But he has his role to, to, to play as captain and, and must hope that the West Indies can turn it around come Trent Bridge on Thursday. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I always say, Faz, is it's one thing to be defeated, and it's one thing to be defeated in a very embarrassing manner. And when we really analyze what happened in that first test, you notice that the West Indies failed to even bat out 50 overs. So let's just say this was a 50 over game. The first thing we'd be talking about is, hey, we didn't even bat the number of overs. Now, this is not a 50 over game. You have the opportunity to bat for long periods of time. So we already see that being an issue. Now, scoring runs, no player also was able to get to 50, well, 40, much less to 50. So again, we can't help but have a discussion here about the West Indies without talking about the batting problems that exist. And it starts from the opener going right down to the tail ender. Well, Mariah, this has been an, an issue since before you were born. West Indies were dismissed for 54 at Lords, the same Lords, with a bat batting lineup of Brian Lara, Ramnari Sarawan, Jimmy Adams, and, and so many others. And, and that was in the year 2000. The West Indies lost inside two days in that same series at Headingley, being dismissed for 61 in the second innings, in the same test match where Kirtley Ambrose reached 400 test wickets. So, so again, let's not pretend that this is a fairly recent development. This has been happening long before the first T20 international was played, before the first T20 franchise tournament was played, long before even Stanford's event in 2006 came into being. So it's, it's a long-standing issue related to the frailty, the fragility, and the lack of consistency, especially in, in West Indies batting. So, so yes, this is just the latest occurrence of that. And, and, and again, as I, as I pointed out, these things keep happening, and we don't seem to be able to find a long-standing solution to allow for West Indies batsmanship to be far more consistent consistent in test match cricket moving forward yeah and you know Faz, i touched on it when we spoke earlier in the west indies first innings batting failure but the highest scoring west indies batter in this test match was guru kishimoti the number nine batsman um, a total of 45 runs no one scored as high as he did um, what does that say about the application of the batsmen who are there to score runs because Moti wasn't there with the primary responsibility of scoring runs. His primary responsibility was getting wickets, but he ended up scoring more runs than every, everyone else in the team, including the, the, the top-order batsmen. Um, does that speak to their lack of application? Because they are, or should be, more skilled to bat than Moti is. 
Absolutely. And, and yeah, you've answered the question yourself, Lance, because we were, we were having that same discussion a bit of it yesterday uh, about that, that ability to concentrate for long periods. Th this is what test match batting is all about. Test match batting is not walking out, hitting a six or four, two sixes, a reverse sweep and, 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 and all of that. Test match batting is occupying the crease for a long time, uh, not losing your concentration after a water break, not losing your concentration at the resumption of a session. It's not easy. And therefore, while they may have the, the fundamental tools as far as shot making and, and the, the basic technique, it takes a lot more of that. It's like the Jimmy Anderson reference. It's not about just bowling the beautiful wicket-taking delivery every so often, but it's about plugging away consistently at a particular line, with a particular uh, way that you're looking to get rid of a batsman. It takes time, it takes perseverance, and it takes consistent excellence. And therefore, from what we've seen of our, our batters so far, that most of them with the lack of experience and the lack of experience, particularly with English conditions, they are not yet attuned to what is required to be consistently successful in test match batting. Yeah, and I want to ask you this, Faz, because we touched on it yesterday, but going into the second test, this is just a three test series. And typically you would go with the same test team that you used in the first test for a second test. Um, depending, of course, if the playing conditions warrant, you know, a serious different look at, at, your, at your roster for the game. But do you think they would seriously consider changes to this team for the second test? The only change I could see it would probably be based on fitness of Shamar Joseph. Whether or not he, the, the, the issues that we saw, whether it's cramp, whether it's a hamstring, whether it's a groin. And what is interesting as well, and, and you would have heard me lament this time and time again, we, we don't get clarity from Cricket West Indies and even the team, wherever they may be, on these matters. Did we get any formal notification before that three-day match that Shamar Joseph and Gudakesh Moti weren't going to be playing? No. We got that based on the fact that they weren't there and eventually it was reported. There, there seems to be this, uh, again, this childish culture of secrecy over these matters, which are fairly straightforward. If someone is injured, they're injured. But just getting back to your question, I, I, I really can't see there be any real reason to say, well, okay, all the, 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 the entire batting failed, so drop, let, let's drop two and bring in another two. To do what? The fact is that these same batters in Australia did well enough, not spectacularly, but well enough to famously help in winning a test match. And, and therefore, to just simply jettison two or three because of a collective failure wouldn't appear to make a lot of sense unless you're satisfied that whoever your options are going to do any better. Yeah, Faz, now that we talk about the West Indies batting, I want to ask you this because we have already accepted that the batsmen didn't apply themselves as well as they should have. Um, Conversely, the England bowling was pretty good. Um, Gus Atkinson's test match hole of the match hole of 12 for 106 is the fourth best in history of a debutant um, bowler. Um, how well did he bowl? How well did England bowl generally to pressure the West Indies into these dismal batting efforts? They bowled very well, and and, and again. Everything worked well for Atkinson. If you look at it, his first delivery, and, and he admitted this after, after, after the match, his first delivery that he bowled was actually better than the second. And the second, which was a wide ball, got the wicket with, with Craig Brathwaite dragging it on. And then after that, everything seemed to go his way. Even today, uh, when you, you would have thought that Jimmy Anderson would have been the one to get most of the wickets, Anderson dropped a court and bowl chance to end the match by taking a wicket with his final ball in Test cricket. And it was left to Atkinson to finish off the match to get a five-wicket haul uh, for the second time in the match and, and therefore uh, finishing a blaze of glory. But again, you're talking about bowlers who are well-attuned, who are well-equipped. Uh, Jimmy Anderson, Gus Atkinson, from the, the most experienced to the least experienced. You've got Chris Wokes, you've got the captain, Ben Stokes, who's back, back bowling again, and he picks up 200 test wickets to, to become just one of three, together with Sir Garfield Sobers and Jack Callis, to have 200 test wickets and 6,000 runs. And I say all of that to say that they are playing in conditions with which they are familiar. Most of them have significant experience. And even if an Atkinson is playing his first test match, he's played enough first-class cricket in his home conditions to know what he needs to do. Yeah, and there's not a long turnaround time for the second test, which starts next week, Thursday, at Nottingham um, 
Faz, how does Coach Coley um, lift his team for this, this second test? Because there, there needs to be some kind of rebound. But I'm sure he's going to draw reference to what the West Indies did in Brisbane, what the West Indies did at Headingley after, after the, the embarrassments in the previous test matches, because it was the same turnaround time. And, and therefore, it's not impossible. So it's really up to the players. A coach can only do so much. And, and I mean, uh, we look to the coach when things go wrong, but we don't look to the coach when things go right. And, and, and therefore, it has to be said that it's up to the players themselves. They, they, they must know. And if they don't know, then that's a serious problem. But they must know that it's not so much about shot making and boundaries and sixes over square leg or whatever but it's about occupying the crease. It's about frustrating the opposition. It's about building an innings. It's about understanding that the, the longer time you spend in the middle, where it becomes easier, and, and therefore you'll finally be able to pick off the runs, and indeed, as Alistair Cook pointed out, not just blocking to survive, because when you just block to survive, sooner or later, the unplayable delivery is going to get you. So uh, it's about taking this time, not just to simply relax and say, well, we have two days off, nor is it about necessarily punishing people by saying, you know what, you're going to spend the next two days in the nets for eight hours, and I don't care what you all have to say and so on, because that could be actually counterproductive. It's about understanding the individuals, understanding the players, and getting them to appreciate what is required. And, and it might have the results, or it may not, because there's very little to be done as far as actual match practice, because there's no match practice at all. There are going to be net sessions, so it's really up to the players themselves to appreciate what they need to do to improve on what was really a poor performance. Yeah, and finally, Faz, is there anything about the Trent Ridge pitch at Nottingham next week that will offer something different from Lords to give the West Indies hope that things could work differently for them here? Well, the one noticeable element is that there will be no slow, and that is one of the unique elements of Lords. And indeed, if it were an international ground anywhere else in the world, it would have been rejected by the ICC because of that slope. But it's tradition, it's the spiritual home of the game, and all that tra-la-la, so that, that's why it's... Tra-la-la, it's all right, fine. Yes, <laughs> one of the quirks, one of the quirks of the game. But Trent Bridge is often known to be a seamless track as well, and it probably depends on the weather conditions on the on, on the first morning, whether or not it will feel well, flatten out if the sun comes out, and therefore it might be a, a bit of a calculation by a captain. If you win the toss, whether you bowl first or you bat first, thinking the conditions are going to be better. But at the end of the day, you have to appreciate that English conditions, English pitches, will always give the bowler something, will always offer a bit more encouragement than we might usually see in, in, in Caribbean pitches and Caribbean conditions. And therefore, you've got to prepare yourself for that. You can't hope that it's going to be a flat track and hot sun all day, because that is highly unlikely in an English environment. Mm. All right, fans, we're going to leave it there. Let's hope the West Indies can rebound and offer uh, more competition for the Englishmen in the second test at uh, Trent Bridge. We have become so accustomed now to these kinds of days in West Indies cricket. There have been many. I started the business back in 1984, Faz, when the West Indies were whitewashing England. Uh, so <laughs> that, that's that's quite some, some, some time ago. So we've been accustomed now to having to endure the, the, the change in fortunes of this West Indies team. Well, you enjoy the glory days like all of us. Now we, now we all have to endure. Let's put it that way. But that doesn't happen for me. I just have to endure. <laughs> Break All right, fans, we'll talk next week. <laughs> All right, Ramarak, close the segment. Yeah, we're just going to go to a break while I endure some of Lance. Break time.